In this video, I will help you to understand lumbar radiculopain and how to perform a basic neural assessment. Hi, my name is Justin Lim from Physiomatis. Low back pain is the world's leading cause of disability. According to an article published by The Lancet in 2018, the years lived by with disability due to low back pain have globally increased by 54%. According to McFarlane et al. in 2012, we know that up to 60% of the adult population can expect to have low back pain at some point in their life. And we do expect these numbers to be higher now. According to Steins et al. in 2018, Two-thirds of the patient with low back pain also reports leg pain, and one of the more common causes of leg pain is radicular pain. Now, some of you might be thinking, is there a difference between radicular pain and radiculopathy, or even referred pain? Can we use them interchangeably? I'm going to explain this a little bit further. So, radicular pain is when the pain from the nerve root in the spine is felt, in this case, of lumbar radicular pain down the leg. Classic radicular pain is sharp, shooting, and well localized to the territory of the affected nerve root. The sharp shooting pain often comes with a background ache. On the other hand, radiculopathy is not a painful condition. It's a loss of nerve function caused by an injury to the nerve root. That injury might be a compromise of the blood flow to the nerve root or proper nerve damage. Radiculopathy manifests as a dull reflex response, a loss of sensation to touch, heat, cold, and a loss of muscle strength. Now, one way to think about radicular pain and radiculopathy is that radicular pain is a gain of function problem and radiculopathy is a loss of function problem. Gain of function means that a nerve is firing too many impulses, loss of function, firing too few. It's also worth noting that both radicular pain and radiculopathy can happen together. So, we know that subjective examination is critical in diagnosing any pathology including lumbar radicular pain. Your patient might complain leg pain, which is usually past the knee, leg pain that is worse than back pain, numbness, pins and needles, tingling sensation, and motor weakness. Now, red flags. I will definitely talk uh, and ask a little bit more about red flags questions to rule out cord equina symptoms, metastatic spinal cord compression, spinal infection, and malignancy. Let me know in the comments if you want a video about this. Just comment down below. Apart from the lumbar range of movement and functional tests like a squat, gait, or single leg stand, your neurological test and neurodamming test is going to be an important factor in diagnosing radicular pain. For myotomes and dermatomes, there might be a slight difference in assessment methods depending on where you read and how you were taught at university. As always, start from the better side to get your baseline. For myotomes, how I usually did it is hip flexion to test for L1 and L2, knee extension to test for L3, knee flexion to test for S2, ankle dorsiflexion to, to test for L4, big toe extension to test for L5, ankle plantar flexion and heel walking for S1. For myotomes, I use the Oxford grading scale to rate the motor testing. For reflexes, I would do the patella reflex to test for L3 and L4 or the femoral nerve, Achilles test for S1 and S2 or the tibial nerve. I would use Epson, hyporeflexia, normal, hyperreflexia and clonus to grade my reflexes. So um, for neurological testing, I'll usually get my patient to um, be seated um, with their legs hanging off um, the bed um, in a nice 90 degrees uh, knee flexion um, and make sure that their um, ankles are nice and relaxed, okay? Um, I would usually tell them um, the indication of doing the neurological test um, and also explain the whole process um, on how I would do and perform the test. So, um, if we go straight into the testing itself, from a dermatomal point of view, I would go L2, L3 across the knee, L4, L5 out to the pinky toe, um, S1, and then we'll do S2, which is um, near the hamstring region. Um, it's always important to ask them to compare if there's a slight difference. Um, for example, if the right one is the normal one, I would say, if this is 100%, how would you rate the other affected leg? Um, that is always a good um, marker for patients to describe. For our reflex te testing, again, in a seated position is perfect because we can test both the knees and also um, the heels um, all together at the same time. So always start with the better side just to get the baseline. From a patella point of view, uh, it's just to get the tendon. As our model here has got a really good reflex, so that's considered normal. And then um, if we do the Achilles, we just need to make sure that they are on stretch. So I will dorsiflex the ankle and then do a nice firm 
um, tap onto it. So um, for my autonomous testing, um, each clinician has got a different way or slightly different way to um, perform them. I just do it because it's uh, it makes sense to me and it's easier for me to perform. So I'll start with hip flexion first. Um, so if I can ask the patient to um, bring their knee to their chest whilst I resist them. So that's hip flexion and I would go straight into um, knee um, extension. So if you want to straighten your knee for me and then bend your knee again. Good. And then coming all the way down to um, ankle dorsiflexion. So uh, if you want to bring your ankles to you, uh, we can test the both sides. Similar with your um, big toe extension as well. And then that's where I'll move on um, to the effective side to get um, some baseline and also to check. Um, for S2, which is um, heel walking, if I can ask the patient to have a stand here for me. What I'll ask them to do is basically just go on tiptoes, which gives us a really good, and walk towards me, which gives us a really good indication for um, the uh, ankle plantar flexion. 